Hello everyone! If you were alive in the 2010s, you might remember a game called Minecraft. Featuring simple, procedurally generated landscapes, Minecraft went on to become the most successful game of all time. You might also remember RimWorld, No Man's Sky, Dwarf Fortress, Don't Starve, Spelunky, Valheim, Spore, Starbound, Tales of Majayal, Terraria, and whichever game you're upset that I didn't mention. What do all of these games have in common? They make use of procedural generation to drive gameplay variety variety and keep the game fresh and interesting. But what if I told you that procedural generation actually kind of sucks? I'm sure we all know what procedural generation means based on vibes, but let's define it anyways. Procedural generation means creating something algorithmically rather than manually, which we would call artist authored. Procedural generation isn't inherently random or variable. The results could be the same every time, but when people reach for procedural generation, it is generally for the purpose of having the random, unpredictable nature. Otherwise, why not just do it manually? Minecraft is procedurally generated because its worlds are created on the spot by a complex algorithm. They are not meticulously handcrafted by a team of artists like levels in a different game such as God of War. Granted, in high fidelity games like that, there are potentially numerous elements of the scene that are procedurally generated during development, such as positions of foliage, but ultimately, the artists have decided how the final level design looks, so the distinction is clear. If we take a look at a generated Minecraft world, it's very obvious that it is not completely random, because if it was, it would look more like this picture of white noise which is completely random. Blocks would be everywhere with no rhyme or reason, the sky would be clouded with random blocks, there would be no consistent contour to the terrain, and it just wouldn't look like a world at all. Minecraft wouldn't be very fun if it looked like this white noise. You would be spending most of your time trying to generate a playable world rather than actually playing. The reason there are no blocks in the sky, the dirt on the surface is actually dirt instead of random blocks, the terrain flows nicely, and the trees are all self-similar is because constraints are in place to create somewhat what predictable results and a more consistent gameplay experience. We can conclude that working with procedural generation involves having enough variance to create something unique and fun that the player will enjoy, while mitigating the potential of generating something that is completely unplayable dog shit that will upset the player and make them hate your game. Imagine if in Terraria you spawned into a world where you're surrounded by stone and just can't play the game. Sounds like fun. In more colorful language, working with procedural generation is about taming the chaos of random number generators, but this is a fool's errand, as chaos cannot truly be controlled. Undesirable results will slip through the cracks in most cases. These slip-ups could range from funny quirks that the player will find endearing to the worst-case scenario of unplayability as I've already mentioned. It's because of this that many developers have chosen to move away from procedural generation in favor of artist-authored experiences to entirely avoid those potentially unpleasant results that would upset players. If there's even a 1% chance of unplayability, then 1 out of 100 players are going to have a bad time, and when your audience is millions, that's a lot of unhappy players. This brings us to a problem I had with my own latest project, and how I fixed it. I have here a particle system that is visualizing the attractor of a randomly generated set of affine transformations applied as an iterated function system. You don't need to know what any of that means, but if you want to, please watch my last video. The lighting of our particles is provided through a brute force voxel-based occlusion approximation, which means in order to have lighting, our particles must stay within the bounds of the voxel grid, which is where our problem arises. Because the shapes are procedurally generated, we do not know what the final result will look like, and many random results give shapes that go outside of the bounds, leading to an unpleasant viewing experience as the shapes are clipped. In an ideal world, every single shape we generate would stay within the bounds of this grid, which could be easily achieved by heavily simplifying the transformation logic. No complex transformations means no complicated outcomes, but this comes at the cost of interesting, unique fractals, which was the entire point of the project in the first place. So how could we get the best of both worlds? How can we keep our aesthetically pleasing, crazy fractal shapes while also keeping the shape from growing larger or drifting outside of the bounds of the voxel grid? As it turns out, the solution is quite simple, but first, something a little different. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is the largest online learning community for creatives with thousands
dozens of classes led by actual industry professionals across many disciplines like programming, illustration, business, music, culinary, and more. You can get started learning pretty much anything with Skillshare's Learning Paths, which are curated collections of classes meant to be taken in order to give you the proper path from beginner to intermediate to advanced on a given topic. Skillshare isn't just for beginners though. The learning path I found most interesting was for helping freelancers with price negotiations, as well as building their own personal brand, which is something many of my independent professional colleagues tend to neglect. And if you would like to be an indie developer, I would recommend you learn a lot more about marketing. Be sure to try out everything Skillshare has to offer by following the link in the description. The first 500 people to use my link will also get a free one month trial. Thanks so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Before we get into the thick of it, let's first go over how I am already constraining the particle system to obtain somewhat acceptable results. When I generate a random set of transformations, if they were truly random, then the values could be anywhere between negative infinity and infinity, which in nearly every case would result in an attractor that doesn't exist. For example, any scaling factor greater than one would mean no shape to converge to as the particles grow instead of shrink, escaping off to infinity. We can fix this by applying a constraint to the range of the randomly generated numbers. If we only output a scaling factor between negative one and one, then we get a shape that converges 100% of the time and never anything invalid that would harsh the vibe. Range constraints also give more artistic control over the particle system. Even though a rotation can accept an input between the ridiculous infinite range, we can create much softer shapes consistently by constraining the rotation to a much smaller number, or we can let it go crazy for some more interesting shape transitions as we blend between wildly different angles. Sophisticated parameter constraints are the true lifeblood of more complex procedural generation algorithms. Using Minecraft as an example again, the game uses the y-axis of the world to control pretty much the entirety of the procedural generation logic tree. Above a certain y-value, blocks are far less likely to be generated or can't exist at all. Conversely, below a certain y-value, or veins become more common, and it enables other procedural generation algorithms, such as the abandoned mine shafts and the game's newer, sophisticated cave systems. With carefully picked range constraints, it is possible to more often than not generate a shape that doesn't grow too big or drift too far, and usually stays within the small bounds of the voxel grid. The problem child of the transformation sets is the translation, or the distance the particle moves through space each iteration. Unfortunately, large translations are the key to more interesting shapes, but any translation above a small value causes it to drift out of bounds. Because of this, we can't have our cake and eat it too. We must compromise on the range of translations to keep the drift in check. To fix this, we will have to look at some other method of confining the shape to the bounds without using strict parameter constraints. But what other solutions could there possibly be? The technical term of our voxel grid bounds is ABBA, or axis aligned bounding box, meaning that the planes of the box are aligned with the direction of the axes. It isn't rotated or anything. These bounding boxes are favorable due to their cheap computational cost. All you need is the center of the box and its side length, no cringe rotation computations. We use these bounding boxes to have a very simple approximation of the space that a mesh takes up so that when we render a scene, we can compare that bounding box with the camera frustum, and if it doesn't intersect, then there's no need to draw the object. This means that everything in a game outside of camera view essentially doesn't exist. If we had two boxes, one of side length 1000 and another of side length 5, if we wanted to figure out what value to multiply the first box by, such that it fits into the second box, we multiply it by x and then divide off the 1000 to find that x is equal to 5 over 1000. We could then generalize this to boxes with side lengths a and b. If we were to have a box that all of our particles fit into, then we can very easily rescale that box down to the voxel box using our simple equation we have derived. This would be so nice if we had that magical particle bounding box, but we don't, because our particles and their positions are always changing, and so we are going to have to put in some effort to determine the bounds of the particles in order to solve our problem. For my math nerds in the audience, I have a very, very special problem for you that if you solve, I'll say good job and maybe even give you a cookie of your choice. Snickerdoodles are my favorite. Given a set of n affine transformations, determine the minimum axis aligned bounding box of the attractor of the set. If you prove an analytical solution, I'll be very happy, but I spent most of this month determining that a solution does not exist. So instead, I'll be teaching you all about graduate level parallel programming algorithms. Wow! 
In order to solve our problem, all we need is a bounding box for the particles. Not anything fancy like a minimum bounding box, just a bounding box. The simplest, most common method for finding a bounding box is determining the minimum and maximum values on each axis. This will guarantee a box that contains all of the particles. Even though it may not be a perfect fit, that doesn't really matter. So, given our array of particle positions, we just need to search it and find the minimum and maximum positions. This is kind of a day one programming problem to do sequentially on the CPU. We iterate through the array, checking each element one at a time. If it's the minimum or maximum, we keep track of that, and continue onwards until all elements have been touched. If you remember from my last video, unfortunately, our array contains about 200 million positions and exists solely on the GPU, so we can't do our easy day one programmer sequential CPU solution. Aww. It would actually be a terrible idea to use our particles as they are for our bounding box calculation anyways, because the particles are randomly distributed and are constantly moving around every frame. If we got a bounding box from this, then it would be super super jittery and looks something like this, which just doesn't look very good. So instead, we are going to create a super secret, lower detail version of our particle system, making use of the uniform distribution technique such that the particles have a constant position and aren't noisy. This way, our bounding box will be smooth and consistent, at the cost of more memory and resources spent on generating that lower detail iterated function system. A lower detail system of about 4 million particles should be good enough to find a bounding box that also nearly matches the 200 million system. Now, all we need is an algorithm for efficiently finding the minimum and maximum values of these 4 million particles on the GPU. As I have stated many times, GPUs are designed to do work in parallel, not in sequence, so our simple sequential min-max scan isn't going to fly in GPU land. Technically, we could do it. Dispatching one single thread that scans the entire buffer for the min-max gets the job done, and for 4 million particles, that takes about 400 milliseconds on my 1660, so not very good, but good enough for a web developer probably. The GPU should be doing work across millions of threads, not just one, so we need to figure out how we can scan the buffer in parallel and evenly distribute the workload across as many threads as possible. Since every work group does the same thing, we only need to care about the logic of one group to understand them all. A group of threads is called a warp. A warp consists of 32 threads on NVIDIA hardware, but for the sake of my editing sanity, let's pretend like a warp is 8 threads. In order to create a maximally efficient parallel algorithm, we want each thread of a warp to be doing something. If you recall from all the way back in my pixel sorting video, GPUs have something called group shared memory, which is a local memory bank that's shared across each thread of a warp. Accessing this memory is much faster than accessing global memory, and since we will be fetching memory multiple times across threads in this group, it will be beneficial to load the particles into local memory before we try to find the minimum and maximum values. Now, with this knowledge in mind, given a buffer of 8 numbers, how can we find the minimum value in parallel? First, each thread is going to load the number that corresponds to its ID number into local group shared memory. We will operate on this local array to find the minimum value before writing the result of the scan back to global memory. Since calculating the minimum of two numbers has two inputs and one output, and we have 8 numbers and 8 threads, we only need 4 threads to parse these 8 numbers. Threads 0 through 3 will take their corresponding number and the number in the array four elements to the right, calculate the minimum, and overwrite their number with the result. When this is done, we have reduced the eight numbers to four, and now we only need two threads to parse the array. Threads zero through one will take their corresponding number and the number in the array two elements to the right, calculate the minimum, and overwrite their number with the result. With two elements left, only one thread needs to be used to reduce the two numbers to one final minimum value, which we then output to wherever we want, and our algorithm is complete complete. This process is known as parallel reduction, and it is one of the most important fundamental building blocks of GPU programming, so it's definitely something you should understand and have in your toolbox. It's so important because this algorithm works for all kinds of operations. It doesn't matter what method we are reducing by, as long as our operator has two inputs and one output, this algorithm is the way to do it. Whether that is finding the sum of these eight numbers, the minimum, the maximum, or the product, whatever you want. But Ace Rolla, GPUs have a thread group 
limit of 1024. Doesn't this mean that we can only reduce buffers of 1024 elements using this method? A very good point. How could we use this algorithm to reduce arbitrarily large buffers beyond the thread group limit? Reducing 8 numbers is cool and all, but our goal is reducing 4 million numbers. Unfortunately, we cannot do that all in one thread group. Multiple groups are going to have to work together. This is a pretty big problem, as thread groups cannot interact with one another whatsoever. There is no way to sync groups on a global level, only on the local level between the individual threads of a group. This means we're going to have to do the reduction across multiple dispatches to reduce reduce the buffer down incrementally until we only need one group for the reduction. Using the simplest case as an example, imagine we now have 16 elements we want to reduce, double the size of our example warp. We can no longer reduce this buffer within one group, so we instead dispatch two groups. Each group will find the minimum value of its section of the buffer, and then it will write its result back to global memory, where we now have two elements left that need to be compared. Since we can now reduce this within a single warp, we dispatch one final group to compare these last two elements to find the proper minimum. This logic scales infinitely, with a thread group size of 128 and our particle buffer of 4.2 million positions, the first dispatch reduces the buffer to 32,000, the next dispatch reduces it to 256, then to 2. Since our initial goal was to find the minimum and maximum, we must do two separate parallel reductions of our particle buffer. With the minimum and maximum obtained, we take the midpoint between them as the center of our bounding box and use the distance between the points as the extent of the box. The voxel grid is 3 meters cubed, and so to rescale all of our particles down to the grid, we divide the extent of the particle bounds into 3 and multiply our particles by the result while also rebasing each particle to the midpoint of its bounding box so it stays in the center of the voxel grid. Now, our particles will always stay within the bounds of the voxels, regardless of how crazy the procedurally generated transformations are. You might be thinking, geez, Mr. Rolla, that sounds like a whole lot of work to find the bounding box of the particles. It must run very slowly. But no, the reduction of the 4 million elements takes about 0.3 milliseconds on my below average 1660 GPU for a combined 0.6 milliseconds to find the complete bounding box. GPUs are really fast. For reference, it takes my CPU 9 milliseconds to find the minimum of 4 million numbers using the much simpler sequential solution, which is certainly much better than the 400 milliseconds it takes the 1660 to do the same algorithm, but is far slower than the parallel reduction. Overall, this title and thumbnail and premise was ultimately just an excuse to trick all of you into learning about fundamental parallel programming techniques, so no need to take my criticisms of procedural generation too seriously. If you plan on making use of procedural generation for your own game mechanics, be sure to consider how much work you'll need to do to control the chaos and mitigate undesirable outcomes. The average player experience matters a lot, but the potential of a bad experience matters most. Maybe handcrafting an experience would be less work in the long run. Now that my fractals can never leave the bounds and are always visible, I can convert it into a never-ending short-form content farm. So if you want to see some more fractals, check out my new shorts and follow me on TikTok. As usual, a huge thank you to all my current patrons. Without your support, I could never abuse the short-form algorithm in order to inflate my channel metrics and subscriber count. Anyways, that's all from me. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time.